to a, and the, we are a bit excited to Sorry. so so kind of you good, good evening friends Thank and you. today we welcome justice sunil thomas after the retirement we were prior to that also we were pressing upon justice sunil thomas since we were always receiving requests that he should share his knowledge he has already shared his knowledge on this platform and the way he expresses the knowledge is say having a far reaching impact on the and today we thought why not take a topic which has a lot of sig- under the jurisprudence that is uncorroborated testimony a complex the evidentiary value how that evidentiary value takes into place in such a situation where it is uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice is one of the we'll be discussing today we are enamored by the fact that sir has accepted our audio sir so good evening mr vigas uh, this is karnagaran and all my dear brothers and sisters thank you for giving me this opportunity today the topic that we are going to discuss is evidentiary value of an accomplice which is uncorroborated how far it is legally admissible in evidence now just before going into that we will just have a brief look at the scheme of the statute as to how the evidence of an accomplice is admitted in evidence an accomplice as you all know is a term which is not specifically defined under the indian evidence act or in any other statutory provision but as we know accomplice is a person who is a privy party to or who has participated in or who was involved in a crime and in the course of in investigation in the exceptional cases the investigating agency will be faced with one one difficult task they may be able to identify the accused get some materials to connect uh, the uh, crime with the accused but it may be short of a legally admissible evidence in a court of law so that they may have an apprehension that a successful prosecution of all the accused may not be possible due to positive evidence in such cases prosecution may resort to the evidence of an accomplice as i earlier indicated accomplice means a person who has already he was participated in a crime he may come forward he may volunteer to give evidence implicating himself along with all other co accused and how far the evidence tendered by him to the extent it is uncorroborated is the boot issue that we are considering today the relevant provisions under the crpc are section 306 307 and 308 306 and 307 cumulatively provide the scheme as to how an accomplice is to be tendered pardon what you have to keep in mind is that an accomplice need or need not always be tendered pardon and the accomplice can come forward and give evidence he may be a, a witness as far as the prosecution is concerned in exceptional cases by invoking the provision under section 306 or 307 of crpc if he is tendered pardon he stands arrayed as an accused and he volunteers to give evidence implicating himself inculpating himself along with the co-accused he can be granted pardon subject to the conditions stipulated in section 306 and 307 and what is the object of uh, of granting pardon to an accomplice the essential aspect of granting a pardon to an accused is to procure his evidence procure his testimony and in turn he demands for pardoning 
for the act done by him. What happens is that there are certain formalities contemplated under section 306 and 307. Pardon can be granted at any stage of uh, proceedings. It may be at the course of investigation, it may be in the course of, uh, at the time of inquiry, and even at the time of trial. <coughs> the essential fact for granting pardon to an accomplice so that he becomes an approver is that he must be a party to, or he must have participated in the crime. And secondly, he must not have been convicted for that participation. And section 306 says that a person who is supposed to be a participant in a crime, who has involved or is a privy to a crime, can be granted pardon under section 306 at any stage of investigation or trial. There are a few conditions to be satisfied. One is that the crime must be a one which involves a punishment. Liable, uh, the accused must be liable for punishment of more than seven or more years. Or it may be as an as offense which may, try, which may be exclusively triable by, tried by a court of session or a special court constituted under the Special Courts Criminal Law Amendment Act. Essentially, what we understand is that pardon is granted to an approver under Section 306 in exceptional cases in serious offences. It has got its own rationale also. The rationale is that the provision for granting pardon to an accomplice should not be invariably used in minor offences. This is the essential reason. So that the concept of granting pardon to an accomplice arises in cases which are of serious nature, which are of grave nature, which involve punishment of seven years or more. And that confers a very huge, very important, significant discretionary power on the court. <clears throat> the reason is that a person who has been granted pardon escapes from the punishment. So that the act provides for special safeguards while granting pardon to an accused, to an accomplice. The first aspect I indicated that it can only be in serious offenses which involve either tribal by a sessions court or an offense which involves a punishment of seven years or more. And the lone purpose of granting pardon to an accused is to procure his evidence. This has been reiterated by the Supreme Court. I will give you some decisions on that. One is Jaspir Singh versus Vibin Kumar Jaggi. Those who are interested in taking down the citation may please do that. Jaspir Singh versus Vibin Kumar Jaggi, AR 2000. One, SCC, I'm sorry, SC, AR 2001, SC 2734. AR 2001, SC 2734. The second decision is Suresh Chandra Bahari, Suresh Chandra Bahari, Suresh Chandra Bahari, B A H. R I versus State of Bihar, AR 1994, SC 2420. In both the cases, what the Supreme Court held was that the essential purpose of granting pardon to an accomplice under Section 306 or 307 is to ensure that. Persons who have committed serious offences or graver offences do not escape from the punishment. And the next question is, 
can the uh, can, who is to volunteer who is to initiate the process of granting pardon is it for the accused to come forward and offer himself to be granted pardon under section 306 or 307 before going into that i'll tell you the distinction between section 306 and 307 is that under section 306 pardon is granted at the stage of investigation and under section 306 thereafter now normally it is for the prosecution to decide whether it should seek for granting pardon to a accomplice and it is also for the say for the prosecution to decide whether which among the accused should be selected and granted pardon and rather request to be made to the court to grant him pardon so essentially on the aspect whether there should be an approval and secondly from among the accused who should be selected to grant uh, to be granted pardon is essentially within the domain of the prosecution but i'll tell you that there may be certain exceptional cases were in an accused may volunteer to come and come forward and request the court to grant him pardon on on an offer to disclose the entire facts relating to the crime and the involvement of accused involving himself the question is can the court in such instances grant pardon to such a person i will refer to one one decision of the supreme court where this issue has been considered that is in pascal fernandes pascal fernandes versus state of maharashtra ar 1968 <coughs> sc 594 i will give you one more decision that is al saha al saleha beg al saleha a l s a l e h a al saleha beg where is the state 2008 criminal law journal 1500 Al Salaha Beg versus State, 2008, Criminal Law Journal, 1500. These are the two decisions were in, in one case the Supreme Court and in the other case the High Court. Consider the question whether a request from the accused to tender pardon can be considered. What the Supreme Court held was that if a request, if the accused volunteers. the court shall consider that request after giving a reasonable opportunity to the prosecution to express its view <clears throat> whether to oppose or to support it thereby it again implies that it is ultimately for the prosecution to decide whether part is to be granted or not but invariably as i read as i said the request should always come from the prosecution side normally but there may be instances where the accused may come forward but the court shall pass an order after giving an opportunity to the prosecution because what supreme court said was that it is not the lookout of the court to decide whether pardon is to be granted it is essentially within the domain of the prosecution <clears throat> this is what the supreme court said i told you that granting of pardon to an accomplice is a discretionary power which has to be exercised by the court very cautiously having regard to the fact that the prosecution normally comes forward with such a request due to the paucity of evidence secondly it has got the inherent danger of that person who is granted pardon likely to escape a punishment 
there is one more one more inherent danger the courts have always cautioned to that accomplice is a person who has participated in the crime and who has ditched his co accused and there is a case, there is one supreme court decision where an accomplice is denoted as a treacher having participated in a crime begs for a pardon in turn for for implicating the his earlier colleagues so that there is a possibility of the accused or i mean the accomplice embellishing his evidence this is an aspect which should come in come in detail for the later but for the time being understand that a duty is cast on the court to consider the request for granting pardon to an accused carefully and to pass an order necessarily section 306 imposes certain obligation on the court first to pass a detailed order as to why the permission is granted or not granted secondly the order should also specify whether the person has accepted the pardon offered to him thirdly he must be supplied with the copies of all the materials including the order passed by the court free of cost on request these are the obligations imposed on the court while granting pardon why is that the statute imposes a condition that the court should pass a detailed consent order court have said that the co accused have no right to oppose an application made by the prosecution to grant pardon in other words co accused have no role in i have I have no right to oppose an application made by the prosecution or even by the accused, by a, by the, an accomplice to grant him pardon i will give you two three decisions on that <clears throat> one decision is Rendir Basu R A N D W E R Rendir Basu versus the State of West Bengal. That's A R two thousand S C nine zero eight. Rendir Basu versus the State of West Bengal A R two thousand S C nine zero eight. In that case. what the court held was that it is something in between the prosecution and the court and the co accused has no right to challenge a request oppose an application made by the prosecution to tender pardon to an accomplice but at the same time an order granting pardon or refusing to grant pardon is justiciable in a court of law it is revisable that's the reason why the statute demands that there must be a reason order there are i'll give you two three, two decisions on that in state of up state of up versus kailas nath agarwal state of up versus kailas nath agarwal ar 1973 sc 2210 ar 1973 sc 2210 in that case what the supreme court held was that the order granting pardon or order rejecting an application for granting pardon is revisable and can be challenged in a court of law
Now assume that an order is pardon is granted to an accomplice. What will be the legal effect? In one decision, A. J. Paris, P. E. I. R. I. S. A. J. Paris versus the State of Madras. A. R. 1954 S. C. 16. The Supreme Court held that once pardon is granted to an accomplice, he stands discharged for all practical purposes. When pardon is granted to an accomplice under Section 306 or 307, what is the consequence that follow? What are the consequences that follow? Legally, it imposes an obligation on the accused, on the accomplice, who has been granted pardon to make a voluntary disclosure of entire facts which are within his knowledge. Implicating himself as well as other, other, other accused. And under, the, under Section 306, the court is bound to record his statement after granting pardon. So that he is bound by what he has stated before the court. There is also a corresponding obligation under Section 306 that if the accused is not the accomplice or the accused who has been granted pardon is not already on bail, he should be ordered to be detained till the trial is over. What is the purpose of that? Probably it may look very awkward that a person who has offered himself to disclose voluntarily, who has accepted the guilt committed by him, the crime committed by him, and who has offered to disclose it voluntarily, is detained after granting pardon till the trial is over. The rationale is that he shall not be influenced by other accused because he becomes a very crucial witness. After pardon is granted, he becomes a very crucial witness as far as the prosecution is concerned and there is every possibility of the co-accused targeting him, trying to influence him, trying to coerce him and even there is a possibility of threat to his life. So to insulate him from external influences, to protect his life, protect his uh, uh, version, and to keep him protected from all external influences, Section 306 empowers the court to order detention of a person who has already granted, who has, who has been granted pardon. Does it mean that the court is powerless in, in granting bail to him? I will refer to at least two decisions of the high courts, not the Supreme Court decision, which says that in exceptional cases, bail can be granted to a person who has been granted pardon. Those two decisions are They are in N.K. Anil Kumar versus State of Kerala. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There are, the other two decisions are one is Noor Taki, N O O R T A K I, Noor Taki versus State of Rajasthan, 
1986 Criminal Law Journal 1488. 1986 Criminal Law Journal 1488. That was a decision of the full bench of the Rajasthan High Court. It held that an approver can be granted bail even before the trial is terminated even before the trial has come to an end. The other decision is also a full bench decision of the Delhi High Court. In Prem Chand State, Prem Chand State, 1985, Criminal Law Journal, 1534-1534. Prem Chand State, 1985, Criminal Law Journal, 1534. <clears throat> so these two decisions are authorities were in the full, full, full bench of two high courts Rajasthan High Court as well as Delhi High Court have held that even before conclusion of the proceedings bail can be granted to an approver. Now, what is the consequence? Suppose, after granting pardon, an accused, an accomplice, an approver fails to give the correct statement. Either he makes states falsehood or he conceals from the court material facts voluntarily knowingly, what will be the consequence? Section 306 de deal with that. Section 3, uh, no, I'm sorry, 308. Section 308 says that, provides that on a, an application by the public prosecutor informing the court that either the accused, uh, the approver who has been granted pardon has not concealed, has concealed certain material facts knowingly or has stated falsehood. The court is bound to take action against the approver. Now, what are the consequences? If the court is satisfied on an application by the prosecutor that the approver has concealed certain material facts knowingly or that he has stated falsehood. The court is liable to order the prosecution of that person. One is that he will have to face the trial of the offenses of for which he stood charged originally along with any other offense which may be found against him. We charge against him. Secondly, he is also liable for prosecution for committing perjury. And Section 308 are, uh, are subject to two exceptions, not exceptions, two provisos. The first proviso is that even though 308 enables the trial of the a person who has violated the order granting pardon under Section 306. He cannot be tried along with the original accused. He has to be tried separately. He has to face trial independently, not along with the other accused. Reason is obvious. Otherwise, a peculiar situation may come wherein a person whose evidence is recorded the purported to be against the co -accused, the accused, then he is again tried with the other accused in the same proceeding. So the three, section 308 says it is not possible, he has to be tried separately. The second word is that for initiating proceeding against him for uh, uh, stating falsehood before the court for perjury, 
proceedings can be initiated only with the permission of the high court these are the two inbuilt safeguards <clears throat> provided under the statute now a person who has been granted pardon either under section 306 or under section 307 is under a very solemn obligation to tell the truth and to make a complete disclosure of facts within his knowledge because if there is a violation he is always liable for prosecution for the for two aspects one for the original offense of which he was charged and any other offense that may be charged against him plus a prosecution for perjury <clears throat> so this is the scheme of approval of evidence how pardon is granted to an approver how his evidence is recorded and what will be the consequences now we come to i will reiterate that accomplice need not all accomplice when he is granted pardon becomes an approver so the evidence of an accomplice either under section of freedom who has granted pardon or recorded otherwise what is the evidentiary value this is the issue this is the moot point that i have posed before you today can the court rely on his evidence exclusively even without corroboration or does it require a corroboration now there are two important statutory provisions under the evidence act which are relevant in this context one is section 133 of the indian evidence act which says that accomplice is a competent witness as against the accused and a conviction shall not be legal for the mere reason that it is grounded on an uncorroborated evidence of the accomplice thereby section 133 is very clear and categoric it says that an accomplice is a competent witness as against the accused and it also says that a conviction based on the evidence tendered by an accomplice shall not be legal on the ground that it is not corroborated by any other witness so section 133 clearly says that an uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice is admissible and a conviction is possible on the other hand we come to section 114 of the indian evidence act explanation illustration b illustration b to section 114 of the indian evidence act gives a contrary picture it says that an accomplice shall not be a, uh, uh, section 114 deals with certain presumptions certain presumptions which the courts can draw based on the normal course of conduct normal course of uh, normal course of business or conduct of parties as far as we are concerned illustration b is relevant illustration b under of section 114 says that an accomplice shall not be a credit to the witness or he shall not be of any credit the courts can presume that an accomplice is not credit worthy unless his version is corroborated by other evidence now we come to two two important provisions under the indian evidence act which at first blush are contradictory to each other 
which do not go together which do not supplement each other section 1 uh, 133 which says that an accomplice shall be a competent witness and a conviction will not be legal merely on the reason that his evidence is not corroborated by any evidence by any witness on the other hand a note of note of caution is provided under section 114 b illustration b which says that an accomplice shall not be creditworthy shall not be a person with of credit he is not a creditworthy evidence and his unless he is corroborated by other evidence how do we reconcile these two because apparently both the provisions do not go together 133 clearly says that an accomplice evidence a conviction is possible on the basis of uncorroborated version of a witness an accomplice whereas the presumption under 114 b illustration b says that a, an accomplice is not a creditworthy witness unless it is corroborated so that one one provision says that caution is a court that you should not accept the version of an accomplice unless it is corroborated 133 on the other hand says that it is corroboration need is not required a conviction is possible on the basis of an uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice how do we reconcile this is the important issue now there is one thing i which i indicated earlier <clears throat> that is it has been generally recognized that the version of an accomplice is to be looked with suspicion need not be always suspicion with some care and caution what is the reason the reason is obvious here is a person who had participated in a crime there may be exceptional circumstances where he would not have been a voluntarily he would not have participated in the crime along with the co-accused voluntarily it may be a case where due to peculiar circumstances he was pushed into commission of an offense along with others but normally we can say that accomplice is a person who was who is a part person was was participated or a party to or has been privy to the commission of an offense then he turned hostile not turned hostile he turned his sides bargained for an acquittal bargained for a discharge in turn for giving evidence against the persons with whom he had earlier participated in the crime so the court say courts have always said that the evidence tendered by an accomplice should always be looked with some caution here is a person whose version can be who is a tainted person and i referred to one decision of the supreme court where it has even indicated that accomplice or an approver is a treacher who has cheated his colleagues not exactly the colleagues who would with whom who had participated in the crime not only that then he bargained for a discharge by undertaking to give evidence against co the co accused and hence there is always a possibility of not only that the witness the, the, the witness is not a creditworthy person but also his version his testimony may be slightly tainted he may try to justify himself though he may implicate himself he may disclose the role played by him but he will always try there is a very possibility of that person trying to justify himself 
or trying to project the role played by the other accused, whereas subduing or uh, reducing his own role, so that his evidence has to be cautioned, has to be taken with great care and caution. Now, how do we reconcile these two statutory provisions? I'll tell you that there has been a lot of decisions on this aspect referring to illustration B of section 114 as well as section 133 of the Indian Evidence Act. I'll refer to the various decisions and what the courts have held, how to reconcile these two statutory provisions. You cannot exclude one statutory provision and prefer the other one. You have to reconcile both these provisions. Otherwise, it will look apparently contradictory to each other. One of the earliest decisions on that point is In Rameshwar Kalyan Singh, Rameshwar Kalyan Singh versus the state of Rajasthan. Rajas, Rameshwar Kalyan Singh versus the state of Rajasthan. A.R. 1952 SC, page 5-4. A.R. 1952 SC, page 54. Rameshwar Kalyan Singh versus State of Rajasthan. <laughs> the Supreme Court, in one of its earliest decisions of 1952, considered these two statutory provisions and held that an accomplished evidence can be accepted by the court only if it is corroborated to a limited extent by some other evidence. So that what the Supreme Court held in the, the earliest decision was that there should be a, the evidence of an accomplice can be accepted by the court provided there is some corroboration on some material points by other evidence. Now, can we say that uh, court has given a go by to the illustration of the section 133? Definitely, you can say that section 114b uh, uh, deals with the presumption only. One method of finding uh, reconciling both the provisions is that by saying that 114 is only a presumption. Whereas 133 is a provision related to substantive law. And the question of a presumption always stands in the realm of adducing evidence. When the court commences the appreciation of evidence or essentially there are certain decisions which say that the presumptions have, have their significance at the time of deciding the burden of proof. On whom the burden stands? On whom the burden to rebut the presumption uh, rests? So once evidence is tendered by both sides, the relevance, uh, the presumptions lose its significance and what remains is only an appreciation of evidence. So there is one mode of trying to reconcile both these statutory provisions by saying that 113b, 114b falls within the realms of burden of proof. Whereas once evidence is let in by both sides, Depending on, on whom the burden was, then the court has to be guided by section 133 and not by 114B of the Internet Act. 
This is one method of looking at it. But what the Supreme Court held in Rameshwar Kalyan Singh's case was that accomplice evidence can be accepted only if it is corroborated on material points, on at least some material points, by other evidence. In other words, an uncorroborated testimony of accomplice cannot be accepted. And the court said that it is only based on a rule of prudence. Then comes the next decision. That's in 1956. That is Vemi Reddy, V-E-M-I-V-E-M-Y. Vemi Reddy, Satya Narayan. Vemi Reddy, Satya Narayan versus the state of Hyderabad. A year 1956, SC 379. A year 1956, SC 379. <clears throat> In that, Supreme Court almost followed the earlier decision. In Rameshwar Kalyan Singh's case, and held that. There must be some corroboration, need not be a complete corroboration on all material points. Some corroboration of the evidence tendered by the accomplice on some material aspects. And that corroboration need not be on all facts. Because if the evidence tendered by the uh, testimony of the accomplice is completely corroborated by other evidence. The evidence of uh, the accomplice loses its, its uh, significance. So that there need not be complete corroboration, but on material points, there must be some corroboration. And that corroboration should be with respect to two aspects. One is that regarding the commission of crime, and second is that the accused has some role in the commission of crime. Now, to undo these two aspects, there must be corroboration. And the court also said corroboration need not be on all facts. And corroboration can also need, should not also be on direct involvement of the accused but also in relation to circumstances that lead to a probable conclusion that the accused have committed the crime. These were the, this was the law laid down in Vemirandi's case. This was followed by another important decision in the year 1957. That is in Sarvan Singh, S-A-R-W-A-N, Singh, Versus the state of Punjab. Sarvan Singh versus the state of Punjab. AR 1957 SC 637. In this case also, the Supreme Court followed the earlier two decisions which I have referred to, Kalyan Singh's case and Vimiradi's case, and said that and held that accomplice evidence can be accepted provided there is corroboration of it on material points. And the court said, that's a three judges bench decision, it said that an accomplice should satisfy two tests. Only then, if he passes these two tests, only if he satisfies these two tests, his evidence become acceptable. The Supreme Court said that the first test is that to show that he is a credible witness. He is a person who is speaking truth. 
so that the out of the two tests, first the big test has to the accomplice has to establish that he is a credible, truthful witness. Second is that if that test is passed, he passes that test. Secondly, it has to be established that his version is also credible. So, but if you go through these three decisions, what you will find is that all the three decisions go together, reiterates again and again that the version of accomplice has to be corroborated. Then it was followed by the Supreme Court in Piara Singh versus State of Punjab. Piara Singh versus State of Punjab. AR 1969 SC 961. Same view, same decision was uh, reiterated, same view was reiterated in Piara Singh's case. Now I will refer to two decisions of the Supreme Court. In this context, they are Kokangiri, K-H-O-K-A-N, Kokangiri, G-I-R-I, Giri, versus the state of West Bengal. AR 2017 SC 668 and State of Rajasthan versus Balbigar, Balbigar, B A L B I G A R, Balbigar. Two thousand fourteen Criminal Law Journal, three one four. In both the decisions, I will repeat the citation, 2014 Criminal Law Journal 314. In both the decisions, Supreme Court relied on the sole testimony of the accomplice. But since it received a corroboration from other material facts. So what we what 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 the all the decisions point to one thing. The sole testimony of accomplice can be accepted, but there must be some corroboration from other evidence. Now one question will arise: Can an accomplice evidence be? Corroborated by another evidence of another accomplice. Supreme Court has said no, it is not possible. There cannot be a confirmation, there cannot be a corroboration of an evidence of the evidence of an accomplice by or with that of another evidence, another accomplice. Because both are tainted witnesses. So one cannot corroborate the other. That's the rationale. And these all the legal points, all the legal issues which were the subject matter of these decisions were ultimately considered by the Supreme Court in one of the latest decisions of 2020. A three judges bench decision that is in Soma Sundaram versus State. Soma Sundaram versus State, AR 2020. 2020 SC 3327. Soma Sundaram versus State, AR 2020 SC. 
all the decisions were assimilated and it was reaffirmed and confirmed that accomplice evidence can be accepted if it is corroborated. Normally now what the courts use is rather than going for a corroboration, it says it is confirmed by it. Confirmed from, some confirmation is obtained from other materials. So what the Supreme Court ultimately held in this uh, Somasudharam's case was that one, there must be confirmation or corroboration on material points. Secondly, it was said, held that there need not be a corroboration on each and every point. Thirdly, it was said that there must be some confirmation in, in so far as it relates to the testimony of the accomplice evidence, essentially excluding the false implication of the accused. Or in other words, the evidence of the accomplice, the corroboration must go to the extent of first ruling out a false implication. Then from other facts, from other circumstances, from other materials, there is some confirmation of the evidence centered by the accomplice. If those materials are there, it can be accepted. Then lastly, it was said that testimony of an accomplice cannot be corroborated by another accomplice, by the testimony of another accomplice. So virtually, all the decisions which I have referred to, right from Kalyan Singh's case till Somasundaram's case, all confirm that independent a sole testimony of, a, of an accomplice is acceptable provided it is corroborated on material points. So this is the law. Then one question will arise. Has how far, how the court has reconciled section 114b as well as 133. I initially started by saying that these are two apparently opposing provisions. All the decisions now confirm that evidence of accomplice can be accepted provided there is a corroboration. Does it support 113, uh, 113B, explanation B, or it is in favor of 133? Curiously, if you go through all these decisions, you will find that there is no discussion on this aspect. All the decisions refer to one point, accomplished being a tainted witness, his evidence has to be appreciated with certain caution. What is the impact of section 30, 113 explanation B vis a -vis section 133 is not dealt with in any of these decisions. And Supreme Court reiterated every time that it is accepted as a rule of prudence. So this is the law. Then, then one, I, I, I have been trying to answer myself. Then what is the impact of section 133? 133 which says that there can, there need not be, a, a, there has a, a, an independent evidence of sole, uh, sole testimony of an accomplice is admissible. And a conviction can be, will not be illegal merely for the reason that it is not corroborated by any other evidence. Law does not give an answer to that. Decisions only say that as a rule of prudence, 
there must be some corroboration. That is how 113B explanation B, the presumption is reconciled with section 133. So these are the statutory provisions. Now, any doubt on this uh, aspects? Let's have a, I'm throwing it open for discussion. Anybody? I'll try to unmute Mr. Ah. Dr. Mohan. Don't miss, uh, Dr. Mohan. Because I was seeing on the YouTube as well as this. Because ah. you have explained in such an extensive manner. I think that the any yes, doubt. Sir, honorable sir. Ah, ah, yes. I, um, I have a small request. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Ah. Um, when Justice Karnagaran, sir, wants to... Uh, I, 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 I wanted to share his view. Just yes, Karnagaran. Ah. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Mohan, would you like to start you or uh, before going to Justice Karnagaran? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes. I want to yes. Brother, 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 uh, just uh, thought, but if I understand you correctly, because I don't have the Indian Evidence Act with me, yeah. I studied when I was practicing in, uh, when it's, uh, <laughs> about 30, 30 years ago, 40 years ago in yes. India. Uh, you said that uh, 114B yeah. and uh, 133, yeah, there appears to be an apparent uh, uh, inconsistency, inconsistency or yes. inconsistency. For me, I think it's a question of interpretation. What yeah. I, as you said, what I understand is 114B simply says the evidence of an accomplice is not credible. Credible, yes. Essence of exactly, exactly, yes. B, B. Okay, and 133 says even though he is an accomplice. Uh, it can be relied and acted upon even if it is uncorroborated. Yes. Am I, am I right? Yes. So I'll do a thing. I'll just, I'll just, uh, just read it, uh, Brother um, Karnayaran. Yeah. I'll just yes. read the, both yes. the statutory provisions. So let us be very clear on that. Okay. Section one, 114 B. 114, yes. the heading is court may presume the existence of certain facts. Yes. Then explanation, the illustration B says that an any accomplice is unworthy of credit unless he is corroborated in material particulars. Thereby clearly says he is, uh, it is not credible, he is not credible unless corroborated. Then we come to 144, 133, I'm sorry, 133. An accomplice shall be a competent witness against an accused person and the conviction is not illegal merely because it proceeds from the upon the uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice. Understand. Words Understand. are very clear. Words are very clear. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. What 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 I I uh, interpret is this is my interpretation. Yes, what, yes. But actually 114 B, there is no need for us to reconcile. Everything yes. is in order. Ah. 114 B creates a legal presumption ah. impliedly ah. Ah. that you cannot take his evidence, accomplice evidence, as credible. That is a ah. hmm. it, it is a rebuttable presumption created by 114 B. Yes. This can be rebutted. So the burden again on the prosecution to establish, apart from the court's, uh, I mean, assessment of the credibility, weight, and so on. Hmm. There should be some evidence to the effect that the accomplice evidence is credible to rebut the presumption created by 114B. Yes. So when you go to 133, when it says uncorroborated evidence, you cannot simply, there is an implied reading there. And it cannot be, uh, you cannot act on the uncorroborated uh, you can act on the uncorroborated evidence provided it is credible. That is implied there. So corroboration and uh, credibility are two different aspects of yes. evidence. Yes. 
any witness for that matter should be credible that is yes. a general rule all yes. witnesses you should, you should find out i mean whether appreciate the evidence <coughs> evidence is credible yes as the, the one of the judgment distinguished that uh, it should be uh, credible not as a person that person should be credible as well as his version is also credible yes so the one of the judgment you mentioned yes yes though therefore the credibility is general yeah. that is required irrespective of the fact whether it is corroborated or uncorroborated under section 133 of the evidence act then, then so I, 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 I don't I'll, I'll put it this way if that be so if section 114 b deals with the credibility of a witness how can yes. if a, a witness who is not credible be a competent witness under section 133 Because 133, two things are there. It says first part says he is a competent witness. Yes, no. He is a competent witness. Second part says his a conviction is possible even without corroboration. The the implied fact is yeah. that it should be credible. The credible. third element comes into picture. Yes, yes. Credibility. Ah. Credibility as a person, as credibility as to version the subsequent uh, judgments you 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 refer to. Yes. the credibility of the person as well as the credibility of the version yeah. he has given ah. correct for, that two test two like, one is the, one is credibility of that person secondly credibility of his version version yes ah. both i mean when we say credibility there are two elements yes. in it one is the credibility of the person credibility of the version according to the subsequent judgment you mentioned so there is on uh just uh, you know for me it appears everything is uh, in order there is no inconsistency 114 creates a rebuttable presumption that the evidence yes. of the accomplice should be credible it says it is the presumption is is not credible that you must start from that then it yes, is burden yes. but on the prosecution to prove no 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 it is credible so you have to adduce positive evidence to prove his credibility on that mm. particular on and both elements which we referred to before and 133 uh, from my understanding <laughs> impliedly impliedly says you can act on the uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice provided that is credible in terms of 114b because it's a subsequent section 114 then 133 you cannot isolate 133 and interpret it no good would have been better had the had the play had the placing of these two provisions be on the reverse the first one says he is not credible the second provision says he can be he is credible no no doesn't that's say it is not credible uh, 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 114 114 day doesn't say it is it is not credible it is not according uh, to me uh, It, it creates a presumption that it is not credible it is up to you to rebut the presumption and make it because when you say to a 114a you know facts which are in issue i mean issue of facts so that issue as to credibility is one of the issue there that you have to uh, preliminary decide if that be so the- if that be so brother how does it come that when we come to 133 it says yes it did not be corroborated an uncorroborated yes. version of yes. it did not it be corroborated was uh, because it need comp- ha huh. you need 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 not be corroborated provided if it is credible yes, that's true that's true it now what is the need corroboration what what, uh, what credibility what? covers correct correct it's good that we are discussing on this point on an elaborate plane but the thing is that in the supreme court decisions there is no reference to these aspects it only is referred to both the sections at the same time it says but, uh, but, uh, ah it yeah, there, there is absolutely case. no discussion on these two provisions but anyway with the, the first case <laughs> which you 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 cited yes. rameswar versus kalyan Singh, Singh, that case yes, yes. the first time they tried to interpret this this uh, inconsistency So no, in no. That there, case, they, they in, say, in that also, there is no discussion on this aspect. Okay, but they say mm-hmm. presumption of burden of ah. proving. Yes. So that presumption of uh, burden of proof 
presumption of burden of proof we are not talking dealing with 114 this yes. is a presumption of credibility yes or non credibility yes so that is the presumption which we they should have discussed but rather they have gone on to the presumption <laughs> okay. of burden of proof burden correct, of correct. proof is evident evidential burden is completely different that can be assessed only <laughs> after the clo closing of the whole case so let us see what, 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 what does professor dr mohan says what's your view dr mohan uh, you are about to say something uh, yes please please you have to unmute yourself uh, please unmute uh, dr mohan sir ah uh. what as as honorable sir rightly pointed out there is an apparent apparent inconsistency it's not true to say that there is inconsistency what do i how do i put it is 133 says that it is not illegal even if an uncorroborated accomplice evidence is taken into consideration for convicting the accused yes on the other hand there is only a presumption under section 114 b and that too by the aid of the illustration the act gives us a caution that don't be carried away by an accomplice mere statement without corroboration yes and an elaborate discussion with respect to this and the reliability and corroboration corroborative evidence basing on the accomplice evidence has uh, taken place in auto singers auto singers case which you referred to very highly sensational auto singer case where multiple murders take place took place and auto singer could not be even traced out without the accomplice confession and without the aid of the accomplice police yes. were uh, police were put to a very heavy task and it was uh, a very very big uh, sensation uh, all yes. over the country and and in that the court has elaborately discussed the danger it has it has given the caution that there shall not be uncorroborated accomplice statement forming the basis for conviction conviction correct it is it, generally not possible even for the court also to uh, take a decision to convict uh, the accused basing on the co accused version and uh, generally the credibility gets attached to it because he is also getting implicated and uh, on will serve was pointing out section 306 307 and the pardoning of these these particular parts even as as it is contrary to what is laid down or what is uh, what is to be understood as voluntary confession yes and on on one zone there won't be uh, anybody saying that uh, So I think uh, he has. Uh, uh, correct. Some connectivity issue. Yeah, yeah. But be that as it may, the corroboration and the presumption, the interplay between the two, all these sections, especially with reference to section three zero six, three zero seven, then one hundred and fourteen, hundred and thirteen. All you have actually explained it in a very subtle manner, and I'm quite sure that people would thoroughly enjoy the session. It was quite exhaustive and elaborative. and we can understand why you took the academy to such a benchmark that people are appreciating it so thank, thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you all thank you